Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Alison, for the introduction. Thank you, all the places to do this, and thank you again to the University of Oxford for hosting some nice events. And most of all, thank you to all of you um, for making this already a great success because the issues that we're talking about tonight, as evidenced by the late notice that you all got at this venue, are incredibly controversial. They should be, but they are. So thank you for coming out and taking part in the discussion tonight. Over the past year, I've read and heard a lot about how very privileged we gender co critical feminist academics are. I've observed colleagues claim that we're transphobic because we disagree with self identification as the most robust means of defining gender, and because we assert, using evidence, that sex is different from gender and is a worthy subject for scholarly study. None of these critics has bothered to discuss this with me, of course. Swaps on social media are perfectly acceptable, but intellectual engagement is not on the agenda. And it's that which worries me. The last time I spoke at the Women's Place meeting earlier this year, I talked about the history um, that I see as informing the recent rise of transgender ideology. That speech, like all Women's Place meetings, is available on their website. I'm very proud of it. It isn't transphobic, quite the reverse. I talked about some of the facts that I think academia has refused to discuss and the dangers in that refusal. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the issues facing women in universities that I fear are being silenced by the way in which debates about sex discrimination is being curtailed in the current climate. I hope that some of these issues will resonate for you, whether or not you're in higher education. So I want to talk about just how privileged we women in universities are. Let's start with students. We know that women are less than men on average, so guess who's going to be a most interest on their astronomical student debt and having that milestone follow them into mid life and beyond. Then there are mature students. We're constantly told that tuition fees haven't ever led to a decline in student numbers. That's true of 18 year olds, but the number of mature students has no size since 2012, when the Tory and Liberal Democrats weighed raised tuition fees threefold. Between 2010 and 2015, the number of part-time students also fell by more than 50%. Women have long composed the majority of mature and part-time students. Now that second chance to learn has been taken away from so many of us. Let's turn to academic spend. The sex pay gap in universities is almost five percentage points higher than the national average. In some universities in the UK, men pay, on average, 45% more than women. This is partly because women are disproportionately found in the lowest ranks of academia. The staff who rely on hourly pay or temporary contracts of just a few months, usually with a huge teaching load. Without them, many of them women, many of them with care and responsibilities, higher education would be less that they're underpaid and overlooked. The most senior rank a university academic can attain is professor. In UK universities today, women compose just one quarter of all professors. Countless studies show that in occupations where there's a gap this large between the sexes, women are having to outperform men on every front to gain promotion. I think most women, not only those of us in universities, know that that is true. It isn't possible to know exactly what the sex pay gap is within the professoriate, because in most universities, professors negotiate their salaries individually. And more and more institutions, including my own, operate merit pay rules as well. There's a huge lack of transparency around this kind of pay negotiation. But we do know that at some universities, the proportion of women in the top quartile of pay is far less than a quarter. So that's lower than even the small proportion of women who hold the senior posts. In other words, it isn't just that women aren't getting into the senior ranks of the profession in high numbers, although that's a problem. It's also the case that those women who do break through are not paid on a comparable level with men. In other words, we don't just have a sexual pay gap to contend with, 
it's also the case that equal pay does not yet exist. We only need to think about Kelly Gracie, the former China editor at the BBC, and other women involved in the campaign for equal pay there, to know that this problem is endemic in UK institutions. It's not only about higher education. Surveys show that women are less likely to be well paid in Russell Group universities, particularly those with medical schools and business schools and highly paid vice chancellors. That's regardless of how many women those universities employ in senior posts. Russell Group institutions are the UK's wealthiest universities. They offer the greatest job security, research support, and global prestige. <coughs> Yet men disproportionately benefit from those advantages. Even when women do get jobs in these institutions, they're likely to be and remain on the lowest rung of the career hierarchy. Those highly privileged women who get to the professoriate in these elite universities, women like me, are likely to be hugely outnumbered by men and paid less than them. And where are the most privileged women in the entire sector? There are liberal feminists who argue that women have to be more assertive in asking for pay and better conditions. But women who get to be professors in UK universities tend to be confident and articulate. Academic life involves a lot of critical scrutiny from students, peers, and senior scholars. On top of this, women here, like in every other sector, have to battle every day sexism. I don't accept that the responsibility for eradicating inequality lies with women. I place it firmly at the door of those institutions that have perpetrated injustice. But even if we were to accept the liberal feminist argument that women should be assertive in asking for better pay and promotion, it isn't the case that university women have been treated with violence. It is the case that we face institutional sexism at every turn. So what are universities doing about this? Nationally, we have Athena Swan. That's the name of the program that's meant to ensure that universities are committed to achieving quote-unquote gender equality. Athena Swan Swan began in the early 2000s to improve the position of women in science. But over the years, Athena Swan has become more and more concerned with gender equality rather than sex equality. Today, it is compulsory for university departments hoping to gain the Venus One accreditation to show how they intend to help transgender people to achieve equality. Nothing wrong with that. Far from it. We absolutely need initiatives to make sure that everybody can achieve equality, our transgender comrades alongside us. But the Venus One was an initiative established to improve women's position in academia. There is no basis for believing that discrimination against someone on the basis of their chosen gender identity can be solved by the same measures required to solve sexism. After all, women were denied the right to university education for centuries on the basis of our sex. That is the basis of our discrimination. Women were given the right to attain a degree at Oxford only in 1920 less than 100 years ago, and several hundred years after the university was founded. Being formally legally excluded on the basis of our sex has shaped women's educational and employment opportunities for generations. We know from research into the experience of people of colour that the consequences of formal legal exclusion from employment and education don't just vanish once legal equality is achieved. It takes decades, possibly longer, for that legacy to be overcome. And yet the program designed to improve women's equality in UK universities has now, less than 20 years after its establishment, decided that gender equality is more important than tackling sex discrimination. Perhaps unsurprisingly, a recent study found that the Venus One membership has zero impact on the sex pay gap within universities. Worryingly, 
Given this intellectual debate is meant to be a core activity of our universities, there is little space for a discussion of the assaults to our person, our scholarship, and our rights that women face on account of our sex. Over the past three decades, we've been told that women's studies and women's history are all at or biologically deterministic, or, as I heard recently, that it is patronising for women to have courses that bolster the office, focus solely on us, and was recently given to me as a justification for any women's studies degrees. Really? Does that mean that for several hundred years, Oxford University excluded, excluded women? That for the several hundred years that Oxford excluded women, it was patronising men? Was the vote given to women because men found it really patronising to drop political power to themselves? It's hard to believe since women had to fight tooth and nail to get enfranchised and educated. Alternatively, we're told that studies of women focus on the wrong questions. The right questions are apparently all about gender identity, who represents it and how people perform it. That neatly takes all discussion of structural oppression against women because of our actual and potential roles as mothers off the table. In a profession that, as I hope I've demonstrated, is still so beset with sexism, I think we can see who wins from that particular intellectual sleight of hand. I am frankly amazed at the level of debate among academics who revile plus gender critical feminists. Historians have declared me to be immensely privileged for appearing in the Telegraph as the target of the bullying campaign, and in the Sunday Times, suggesting that calls to my sanity may be a sign that academic freedom is under threat. Now, that's not much checked. Historians rely heavily on newspapers as a source for their research, not simply to glean insights into the privilege, but because we recognise that many groups seeking justice or experiencing distress have sought and continue to seek expression in the media wherever they can. What makes those groups who study so different from those lecturers who recently expressed fear and distress about the lack of academic freedom in a piece in the Telegraph fronted by the courageous Kathleen Stock? The difference is that these are feminists asserting women's rights, and the sex pay gap, the acceptance of sexual harassment, and the casual employment of thousands of women were all very wrong with plenty of male academics, including those who say they prefer not to get involved in the debate. In a profession this unequal, non involvement is a political statement in itself. It is the case that many, though far from all, of the university academics who are seeking out the values of us are in senior positions. That's partly because there's a generational difference in our code of gender critical feminism, but that doesn't fully explain why we're in the front line. I can think of many young gender critical feminist scholars who have approached me after public lectures or at book festivals and whispered their fancy solidarity. Whispered. In the 21st century, women are still feeling unable to stand up for their rights. The sad fact is that women at the bottom of this and many other precarious career ladders often feel they can't speak up for their rights. It's the rather as our own credit that she's shown that they can. But bravery like hers shows just why it is incumbent on those of us in senior posts to speak out. It is precisely because we do have a modicum of power and privilege that we should speak up, not only for ourselves, but for all the women in less secure positions. Both we sneer at us women academics as privileged, as if, like our embarrassment, we have earned our role, might have to consider how we got here. For me, at least, the reason is feminism. I struck lucky as a graduate student at the University of Sussex, which back in the 1990s employed a number of leading feminist scholars. They unashamedly taught and researched women's and feminist history. They fought great battles against sexism within the academy. Thankfully, when I was in my twenties, there was no sense that feminism was so generationally specific that we could learn nothing from other women. In fact, there was an awareness that, having lived through the women's liberation movement, they might have quite a lot to teach us. I'm so glad, because thanks to their encouragement and solidarity, I found myself a part of a feminist network of academics as I progressed through my studies and then my career. 
Don't try and help me to do that by writing references, recommending me, and by opening up space within higher education where scholars can do the kind of work that I now do. And when inevitably, under proposition or talk down to this graduate student, it was these women who kept me going. When I prayed at conferences for my manly presentation, <laughs> it was these women who rolled their eyes by encouraging me to believe I could be both female and assertive. When in successive jobs, I could be mistaken for other female colleagues who have not been like me, it is with these women in mind that I have pulled out such male stupidity. When I leave the world men, who appropriately insults the feminist I'm both from, and sometimes even my own work, it is these women's refusal to put up with sexist bullshit that enables me to call out racism. In other words, when I go about the business of being a female academic, it is these women's solidarity, feminism, that keeps me going. Women's legal rights for university education and a professional career were won only very recently. In historical terms, we only just got here. And that is not a position of great strength and power, as the no value of true student numbers and the use of females as casual lay in universities show. We had to fight every step of the way. We got none of this from male relevance. It's down to feminists that we won the right to take a degree and to work here. Feminists ensure I'm entitled to equal pay and treatment at work that God knows that I can both go to. Thanks to feminists, I'm able to research women's lives and sex inequality. But when an Oxford graduate writes in the Guardian that we're on the wrong side of history, he just confirms that many men still think they're entitled to define what history is and who's worse than that. that women's presence here is a privilege for which we should be grateful or ashamed. It is a right, one that should be further extended. It is because of feminism that women in universities and beyond have a language to talk about the sexism we face. It's because of feminism we have weapons to tackle that sexism. One weapon is solidarity, another is a public voice. It isn't easy to seek out, but as Audrey Lord said, your silence will not protect you or anyone else. And if women with a modicum of power don't speak, then who will? When I speak, I'm not doing so to deny anyone else their rights. I speak in solidarity with all those who experience sex discrimination and harassment in this profession and beyond. I speak in solidarity with those millions of women, past and present, denied an education or a career simply because of their sex. When those who sneer at us start campaigning for women's rights and against sex discrimination, then I'll be willing to believe that they are really committed to ending unearned privilege. But they aren't. They just want to shame us into believing we should not be here and show us up. Well, they've already lost. Look around at the power and history in this one room. It took courage and endurance for women to break their way in here. It took fortitude to withstand the fury they faced. They did it. We got here. We are here to stay, and we are not going to be quiet. Thank you.